So yeah, I'm going to talk about labour market accelerators, and I thought what I would try and do is give a bit of an overview of, of how these things work and where the field has got to, um, without going into too much detail, I hope. And I will finish by trying to give a sense of, of uh, what the main challenges are, which, which remain, and uh, I'll give a little indication of the sorts of things we're doing here to uh, meet at least, or to try to meet at least some of those challenges. So let's, let's start with um, a couple of cartoons and, and some, some pictures. So these are um, quite well known accelerators. Um, <coughs> I'll go this way. Um, and in the top right, we've got a picture of the diamond light source. That's just down the road. It's about 25 minutes down the 34. And that's a synchrotron. And what that machine does is it takes beams of electrons with energies of about 3 GeV. And um, the main thing it does is it passes those beams through bending magnets or things called wigglers or undulators, which you'll see an example of later. But these are essentially arrays of uh, north-south pairs of magnets and then north-south, south-north, north-south. And the idea is as you put the beam through, you make the electron execute a transverse oscillation and that causes it to radiate because it's, it's being accelerated. So these are light sources based on electron beams and uh, they give um, radiation from the visible through to the X-ray region. Um, they're quite expensive, they cost uh, a few hundred million pounds. Um, and they're quite big, so about the size of a football stadium or cricket pitch, whatever you want to think of. The accelerators are around about 150 meters long, roughly. Um, and so these are sufficiently expensive and sufficiently big that countries have a few of them, or maybe one, um, uh, but not lots more than that. Now, the other example, it's not come out so clearly, but the LHC, so that red line. Um, shows you where the tunnel is. Now that machine, as you know, is 27 kilometers around. It will accelerate protons, uh, and enter protons at 7 TeV. It costs about two gigapounds. Um, and of course, it's an amazing machine. Uh, it's absolutely amazing, and will give some fantastic results. But it's big, and it's very expensive. Now, why is it expensive? Well, the, the sort of basic technology that, that drives these things are radio frequency cavities, and uh, I've drawn a very clear cartoon of one in, in the bottom here, and essentially what we have is we have, in its simplest level, you can think of it as some uh, electrodes um, with, with some voltage between them and a, a charged particle bunch here, which will be um, attracted to the next set of electrodes, and just as it comes through, you switch the polarity so that it pops through to the next cell and then keeps being accelerated along. It's a little bit more complicated than that, essentially it's a resonant cavity, but that's the basic idea if you're using uh, electric fields established in uh, conducting cavities. Now for um, straight technological reasons, the, the maximum acceleration gradient that you can generate in these things is about 30 megavolts per meter, and that sets the size of the machine. If you try and go above that, then typically you get uh, arcs and sparks forming, and the thing breaks down. So there's a lot of effort to try and increase that number, but it's not going to increase by probably even much more than a factor of two. Um, and so we're stuck with that gradient, and hence we're stuck with that kind of machine. Um, this is just a slightly nicer picture. Uh, that's from the European XFEL. Um, that's a simulation of the fields inside one of these uh, arrays of RF cavities. Now what I want to talk about is, is how can you use intense laser pulses plasma, that's an ionized gas, to, to accelerate charged particles. And to be clear, I'm basically going to concentrate on electrons or positrons, um, just because that's really the, the, um, the area that has advanced most in, in recent years. Um, everything stems from this paper, 1979, by uh, Kojima and Dawson. And if you can read the abstract, I'm not sure whether you can, but all the ideas are there. It says that if you take uh, a laser with a, a power density, what they mean is an intensity, that says 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter, um, and you shine that onto a plasma of density 10 to the 18 electrons per cc, you can get giga electron volts uh, in centimeters. In other words, that's um, 100 G per centimeter. That's a thousand times B 
bigger gradient than you can do with that sort of standard radio frequency um, approach. Um, and so your machine can be a thousand times smaller. And so in principle, you can fit a large hadron collider in this room with a couple of bends. Um, and so that single number is the reason why the field has attracted quite a lot of attention. Um, and I like to, to, to think that a thousand, if you apply a thousand to your bank balance, right, and you multiply your bank balance by a thousand, you suddenly realize a thousand is quite a good thing to have on your site. It would depend on the site, of course, but um, anyhow, a thousand is a big, it's a big deal. Um, so that's the motivation, if you like, for a lot of work since, since that point. And it took uh, more than 30 years to, in fact, realize that basic idea as I'll, as I'll show you. So in outline, I'll give you a little overview of how these things work, and then I'll move on to progress and, and give you a sense of where the difficulties lie at the moment. So what we'll do is start with a cartoon picture of how plasma accelerator works, and then move to, to discuss a little bit of the physics behind them, but not in great detail given, given the time of the day. Um, and uh, then I'll show you some results. So here's the basic idea. You, you have, um, in this cartoon, the red blob represents a laser pulse. Um, and in this cartoon, we're moving along with the laser pulse. So that means uh, fresh material is coming from the right, and this is going to be fresh plasma. And the, the laser exerts a force on the charged particles of the plasma called the contramotive force. I'll come back to that in a second. But the um, action of that force is to push charged particles away from regions of high gradient of intensity. Um, so the electrons are pushed out like this. The ions are also pushed, but because they're more massive, they essentially don't really move. And so the first order, you can think of the ions just coming straight through, but the electrons being displaced around the laser pulse, or think of this as water flowing around the stone, or something like that. Um, so the electrons are kicked out, they come around the back of the laser pulse, and then they realize that there's a large positive charge here formed by the ions, so they're pulled back in, they overshoot because they have momentum, and so we've got a region just here of excess electron density, hence a large negative charge, so they repel themselves, and get kicked back out again to form a region of uh, too few electrons, or hence a region of positive and this pattern will continue. And so what the force, the fundamental force is doing here is setting up a density wave. Uh, it's represented by the purple and white regions here, um, which will follow the laser pulse. And because we've got a, a, um, a range of electrical densities, we have uh, electric fields which put out within that. And it's those fields that you can use to accelerate particles um, if you get them into that structure, which is known as a wake field. Um, what is the fundamental force? Well, the fundamental force, without going into detail, is essentially the Lorentz force in um, a, a field which is spatially or temporarily varying, or both in this case. And what that means is, if, if the, here's the laser pulse, this is the electric field, um, electrons will be driven by the laser pulse, by the electric field, but on their journey, they'll move into regions where the field strength is different, and that means Whereas for a plane wave, the, the trajectory could essentially be closed, just oscillate up and down, okay? They move into regions where the field is lower and they don't quite come back, and so they, they oscillate and get pushed out away from regions of high intensity. And so if you run, run this through properly, you'll find that there's a force in form of the gradient of the intensity. That's all we, all we need to know uh, for, for today. Um, I'm going to just mention a couple of things I'm not going to mention. Um, you can do the same thing with a particle beam. So if this is a bunch of electrons or protons, that's going to push the plasma around by the Coulomb force. And so plasma accelerators are also driven by particle bunches as well as laser pulses. And that's a slightly different field. I'm not going to go into the detail, but many of the ideas uh, we'll discuss are the same. And some of you may have heard of ion acceleration, so that's accelerating protons or carbon ions, that kind of thing. That's also very important. But the, the operation is very different because there one uses intense laser pulses interacting with a solid target. And uh, again, the, the details are different, so I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm mainly going to talk about um, accelerating electrons or positrons in this, in this kind of structure. Okay, so how do we figure out how big the fields are? So how did Tajim and Dawson do this? Well, they 
turn to everyone's friend Maxwell's equations. Um, and just to give you a flavour of how you do the calculation, it's, it's really simple. If you assume that you've set up an electrical density which is sinusoidal, so this is a travelling wave um, going at the speed of light, so it's oscillating at the plasma frequency or omega p. You may have remembered this from your second year electromagnetism, so that's the natural oscillation frequency of the plasma. If you pull the electrons to one side, they just flow back um, and they oscillate on omega p, which goes by the square root of the density of the plasma. Um, so the, the, uh, the electron density will oscillate uh, at that frequency and kp is the wave number um, and that's just set by omega p over kp being the speed of the, the wave, which in this case is roughly the speed of light. So you can imagine driving a wave and it's got some amplitude delta n e and now I can calculate the field because I know the charge density, um, rho, that's just the difference in the ion density, which is the average density minus this electron density times the fundamental charge, and that charge density is equal to the divergence of D, which is related to the electric field. So integrating that gives you the field. And the point of this exercise is that you can see the field goes like the amplitude of the wave, which makes sense, and some constants. Those constants are called, or together they're called the wave breaking field, and that gives you the scale of the electric field you can generate. Because if this amplitude is normalized to one, so if delta n e is equal to n naught, it can't get bigger than that, then um, uh, that's a one, and then that's going to be the scale of the electric field. So that's an important number, and you can see like it goes like the plasma frequency, so therefore it increases with the density to the square root. That's the basic physics of how you figure out the field. Um, for those of you who'd like to read it, uh, there's a final question, paper 82, uh, 2008, which looks very similar to this um, for reasons which I'll let you deduce. Um, okay, so that's the basic field. Let's put some numbers into there. If we put to Gina and Dawson's numbers in, how does it pan out? Remember, they said you need about 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. Just in passing, let's notice that that's about a joule of energy in about 50 femtoseconds. Um, the reason 50 femtoseconds is important is that at that density, the plasma period, that's the oscillation period, is 100 femtoseconds. So you need this thing to be shorter than the, the distance between the peaks and troughs. Um, you need to be about half the, the plasma wavelength. Um, otherwise, you won't effectively drive the, the wave. So you want to sort of push the electrons forward from the front and backwards from the back. If this is wrong, that's just not going to happen. So you need the pulse to be short, and roughly speaking, it needs to be at less than half the plasma period. So it needs to be about 50 femtoseconds. And um, to get the intensity, you need, you need to focus it to a spot size on the scale of a few tens of microns. So uh, if we do that, and we put this density into our wave-breaking field, then we get about 100 gigabytes per meter as advertised, um, and again, that's, that's the motivation for the whole field. Now, one more little bit of um, physics, just because uh, I want to introduce a concept that's used a lot, it's talked about the normalized electric potential, and here the basic idea is if you think about charged particles oscillating in an electromagnetic wave, then the equation of motion will be, um, the PY dt goes like the Lorentz force E, so that's an easy thing to write down. You know how the field goes in terms of the, the vector potential, so E is minus um, dAdt, and you know how the B field goes in terms of the vector potential. So you can recast the equation of motion in this way by normalizing the momentum to mc. That's a sensible thing to do, and you'll see now that this quantity keeps appearing, so it's the vector potential divided by mc times the charge. Here and here. And so it makes sense to give that a name, and it's called the normalized vector potential. The reason that a useful measure of the laser intensity or laser field, in fact, is that when A becomes close to 1, the motion of the electrons are relativistic. Okay, so sometimes I'll talk about the A of the field. There's an engineering formula here for calculating uh, A naught in terms of the, the peak intensity. And um, we're basically going to be operating with an A0 close to 1. And sometimes this is a little bit big. Okay, so what do these waves look like? Um, this is a little um, simulation of, of uh, the 1D simulation of how the wake 
changes as you change the laser intensity. You know, this is the one here that's in the 1D uh, form. So, so the red dot here gives you the A0 of the laser, that is the peak of the laser pulse um, on this scale. Okay? And this plot here is showing the electron density. And if you, if you sort of catch it, you'll see that this wave, the electron density, starts off looking like a sinusoid, which is what we, we assume to start with. Um, so there. But then it becomes very spiky and nonlinear. And that's because of the nonlinear interaction between the laser pulse and the plasma. Likewise, the, the laser field uh, is sinusoidal. Sorry, the electric field within the plasma is sinusoidal to start with at low values of A0, but it becomes sawtooth like um, at at high um, uh, values of A0. And one of the reasons for that is the electrons in the, in the wake are oscillating longitudinally, remember they're being driven by the laser pulse, um, those oscillations become relativistic themselves and so the mass of the electron changes depending upon where it, or how it's moving. And that, that changes the shape of, of the plasma wave and that, that effect will come back uh, later on. Okay, so we can drive a wake field now. Um, we've got a rough sense of what it might look like. Um, what are the limits to that plasma accelerator? There are two main ones. Um, one is uh, that the charged particles will overtake the wake field at some point. The reason for that is that if you have them sitting in some little bit of um, space in the, in the, in the structure, uh, they're being accelerated. Uh, they very quickly become relativistic, so they have a gamma of a thousand or several hundred. So they're going very close to C, whereas, as we know, the, the light pulse will go at the speed of light. So it's the speed of light in the medium, not the speed of light in vacuum. So, so the laser pulse will be going a little bit less than C, which means this whole plasma wake field structure is going a little bit less than C, and eventually uh, the, the particles will overtake and go into a region of deceleration rather than acceleration, so you need to stop the accelerator uh, before that happens. So that leads to a characteristic distance of the phasing distance. Um, the other limitation is simply that you're transferring energy from the laser to the plasma, that's what you want to do, so it's not bad, um, but eventually the laser will run out of energy, so there's a pump depletion length um, as well. And we don't need to, to go into the details too much, I've, I've put the formulae for these things um, in the linear regime and the nonlinear regime, which is higher North. Um, but what you'll see is in both cases they scale like the cube of the plasma wavelength or 1 over the cube of the frequency um, and they, they depend on the wavelength of the driving of the laser in some way that's not so important. So they vary in density as 1 over the 3 halves power of the, uh, of the plasma. And what that means is if you're trying to think in very simple terms about the energy gain of your accelerator so how much energy do your electrons gain, then you can see that it's going to be something like the field you develop, so let's take the wave breaking field, because that's the order of magnitude of the thing, times the shorter of these two limiting lengths, and so you've got a square root times this thing, and so therefore the energy gain goes like one over the density. So if you want to accelerate to a bigger particle of energy, you need to drop the density of your, your plasma, uh, but you need to increase the length over which you accelerate. And that, that will turn out to uh, have some interesting consequences in, in a moment. So the final sort of bit of background, if you like, is where do these particles come from? And um, the answer is they come from two, two possible places. One is you can throw these things in, so you can have another accelerator and you just throw them into the plasma wave. And if they have enough momentum, they'll, they'll gain um, enough um, momentum or velocity whilst it's sitting in the wake field, that they'll end up going at the same speed as the wake field, and therefore they'll, they'll stay there, and then they can be accelerated. Um, if they don't have enough momentum, they fall backwards, and they're not trapped. Um, now that's one way forward, but of course that means you need another accelerator um, to squirt these things in, and um, that, that's uh, non-trivial, because um, you also need this particle bunch to be very short, because that's under 10 per second. So there is a lot of work in that area, but it's not the easiest way forward. Um, there are other ways of um, providing electrons, which I won't talk about, which rely on other laser pulses. Um, but at the moment, what people tend to do is just drive this thing very hard, so you have a very strong wave field, 
And then you find that electrons from the plasma itself can become accelerated and trapped uh, and accelerated away um, without having to provide an extra source of electrons. So it's much easier to do that. But as you might guess, that's not a very controlled process at that level. It has some consequences, um, as we'll see. So most experiments, in fact, these, these electrons come from the type of plasma and the reason they get trapped is you, is you drive a very strong wave field which can pull out the back, background uh, electrons. Okay, so let me try and give you a little sense of, of the development of the field since, uh, well, the early 80s or 90s without going into too much detail of the, some of the old stuff. Um, one, of, one of the things we realise is that the progress has largely been driven by uh, developments in, in lasers reasons which are not too surprising. Um, I mean, this is the original concept, you have a short laser pulse, okay, which is shortish compared to the plasma period and it drives this nice wave field and, and off you go. But in fact, um, the, the people who wrote the original paper were largely theorists, not experimentalists, and it was a little bit misleading to think that you could actually do this. Um, so what people did originally was take longer laser pulses, it was too difficult to make them very short, so they had much longer laser pulses on the scale of a nanosecond, which is quite a long time. Um, and they would superpose two laser pulses with slightly different frequency. And if you do that, then the envelope modulates, you get beating, essentially. Um, and so you select the frequency difference of your two laser pulses to, to match the plasma frequency, then the, uh, the time period between these um, pulses is, is the plasma period. That's exactly what you need. And so um, each little bump here excites a wave, and they add up coherently as so the wave grows, the plasma wave grows towards the back of the laser pulse. So the lasers go to the right, and the wave is slowly building up to the back. That's called a beat wave accelerator. And um, that allowed people to accelerate, as you can see from these results here, electrons up to tens of MeV. Notice this is a log scale, so most electrons have very few MeV. Um, in fact, they have the energy they were uh, injected, so this, this, this is actually an experiment in which electrons were really squirted in from a conventional accelerator, I think it's 12 MeV, um, and then you're looking for uh, electrons above that. So you can see there are some up here which have got 30-ish MeV. Um, so that, you know, that shows you basically you drive away from nuclear accelerated electrons and you get energy gains of tens of MeV in some millimeters. So it's, it's, it's progress, but it's, it's not quite a real accelerator. A bit later on, people realized that you could do the, um, the simple thing, which is just to sort of, again, sort of hit the plasma a little bit harder. And as lasers develop with a bit more power in them, it was possible to put a, a long pulse into the plasma, it would self-modulate. So this, this pulse, the red the laser pulse, it would have started off as a smooth, let's say, Gaussian pulse, but the, the laser interacts with the plasma, the plasma interacts with the laser to modulate it, and lo and behold, it modulates it automatically at the plasma frequency. So this is a bit like the beat wave idea, but you just let the thing propagate for some millimeters and then the laser pulse starts to sort of develop its own modulation and drives a much stronger wave field. And that allowed electrons up to tens of MeV, towards 100 MeV to be generated. Again, this is a log scale, so we have a very broad band of electron spectrum. So it doesn't look much like a high quality electron beam. Um, but it's still impressive, we're getting 100 MeV electrons, and these are highly relativistic, from uh, plasmas which are quite short, so this is what the experiment would look like. You just focus an intense beam into a gas jet, which may be one or two millimetres across, and that one or two millimetres is enough to get up to the to 100 MeV range or so. Now, that work was done in 2000-ish, um, yeah, 1998, right-hand side. Um, and at that sort of time, there were was, was developments in laser physics which allowed much shorter pulses to be, to be developed. And the key idea is a thing called chirp pulse amplification. So um, some of you may have heard of this. Um, the, the basic idea is the following. If you, if you want to generate a very short pulse, by definition, the, the spectrum of that pulse must be relatively broad. And so you have a reasonable bandwidth of, say, 10 nanometers or so um, to play with. And if you 
So you can generate these bosses quite easily, just for the boss phase, really. You can, you can make a perfect understanding of bosses without too much difficulty. Um, but what you'd like to do is, is to amplify that to a few joules to try to accelerate. Now, if you just take one of those pulses and put it into an amplifier, the first thing you'll do is drill a hole in the amplifier because the, the peak intensity of the laser gets higher, gets much, uh, the fields of the laser pulse get much stronger than the fields holding electrons into the materials, you just ionize it. So the only way around that, uh, until this is developed, is to make the beam bigger, so you drop the intensity. But then you rapidly have beams on the scale of a meter, propagating around your lab, um, so therefore your amplifiers have to be very big, it gets too expensive, and that, that was a, a sort of fundamental limitation. Now the neat trick that was developed in, I think, 1985, is, is the following. If you take a short pulse, which is remembers the bandwidth, and put it into a stretcher, which um, is a pair of diffraction gratings. That, that plotted line represents a diffraction grating, and that's the second one there. Don't worry too much about the lenses in the middle. Um, you, you can create a system in which the optical path through there depends on wavelength. But what that means is, for example, the, the red light will come out of this before the blue light, and therefore your pulse will stretch in time. So it starts at 30 femtoseconds, it comes out at maybe 100 picoseconds or longer. So you can drop the peak power of your laser pulse by the stretch factor, which could be 10,000. So you can drop the peak power by 10,000, which means you can amplify it to 10,000 times more, um, um, uh, the higher energy than you could have done without that 10 pulse stretch. So you, you stretch the pulse, amplify it, so it comes out long, it's still long, but now it's got lots of energy. And then you put it through a thing called a compressor, which, well, that's just the same as the stretcher, but it undoes the stretch. So it's another pair of diffraction gratings configured slightly differently, and that reverses the, uh, the stretch you apply here. So that's called chirp pulse amplification, and it's allowed the, the peak powers of laser systems to go up by factors of uh, several orders of magnitude, I mean, probably more important. So this, this was being developed um, in just a high power laser in the 1990s or so. Um, this is a photograph of probably the state of the art of these systems, this is the last Berkeley lab, it's called the Bella laser. Um, you can see it's not small, um, it's a few of these lecture theatres big, and this delivers 40 joules of laser light in 40 femtoseconds, that's a petawatt. Um, which is a lot. Um, and so these sorts of systems, not at that level, but at the terawatt level, were, were coming on stream in, in, the, in the late 1990s, and that led to uh, the development of a slightly different idea of on plasma accelerators called uh, the bubble regime. And the top uh, movie is a um, simulation, of course, showing what happens if you drop an intense laser pulse. So this is on the scale of a few tens of the 18 watts per square centimeter, but really quite a short pulse, so probably uh, 20 or 30 femtoseconds into a plasma. And you can see that what's happening here um, is that uh, the, the electrons are being expelled from the plasma. So there's the laser pulse there, the, the yellow, and the dark bit here means there are no electrons left at all. So they're coming in and they're just being completely expelled from the region behind the laser pulse to form a cavity. Okay, so this is a still. Um, it's an almost spherical region sitting right behind the laser pulse with no electrons in it at all. And electrons will um, come, some electrons will come around the inside of that bubble and become trapped. So that electron following this path here will get pulled into the laser, into the sorry, into the cavity by the strong um, field set up in that in that wake field and become trapped and accelerated. And you can actually see that in this in this uh, simulation. So these these two dots oscillating up and down have, are bunches of electrons that have been sucked into the bubble and a bit of being accelerated. And you can see a couple of things there. One is you can see the phasing occurring because in the simulation we're moving along with the laser pulse, uh, which is a bit less than the speed of light, whereas the electrons are going at pretty much C. So they're overtaking the bubble, they move from the back of the bubble to the middle, and that's where they stop accelerating and they, they start slowing down again. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is they oscillate transversely. Um, that's called beta from motion, and that's simply the movement in the transverse electric field set up in, in the structure. So this became a, a big um, sort of breakthrough because it allowed as simulation showed, as these papers demonstrate, 
It allowed electrons to be self-injected from the plasma and also to get the conditions right to generate fairly distinct bunches with well-defined energies. I'm not going to go into detail as to why that is. But shortly after those um, papers, three groups published uh, what became known as the Dream Beam uh, results um, in which they showed electrons being generated at about 100 MeV. But notice these are not uh, thermal anymore, they are near-energetic, sorry, near-monoenergetic um, spikes, it looks a bit like a proper accelerator. So here's another spectrum. So uh, it's a well-defined beam with a fairly well-defined energy. Uh, and all of a sudden, the field started to, to get a lot of interest from in people outside plasma physics. So the question now is, okay, well, we can make 100 MeV with my atomic G, because that's, that's what you have in synchrotron. That's a sensible thing to go for. How do you do that? Well, if you remember the scaling rules we, we just looked at, um, the energy gain of the accelerator goes like 1 over the density, and the length of the accelerator goes like 1 over the density to the 3 halves. So from 100 MeV to a GeV, I need to drop the density by 10, I need to increase the length by 30, and the dream beam things were done with jet jets of about a millimeter or two, so now I need to go to 30 to 60 millimeters of target. Now that's a problem because, as we know from um, our second year optics, if you focus the, the laser beam down to a small spot size, so the transverse extent here is denoted W naught, and remember that might be a few tens of microns, is going to diffract. And it will diffract um, over a length scale, and there's a radio range, which is the square of the beam diameter, roughly, divided by the wavelength of the laser. And so if you put in reasonable numbers, so 10 microns or so, um, for W naught, then you find a radio range of less than a millimeter. So you can drive these things in a gas jet, which is a millimeter across, but you can't just ex extend this to 30 millimeters doing something else. So there's something else is to build a uh, waveguide, but remember this waveguide has to withstand a laser intensity of 10 to the 18 watts per square centimetre, which is a lot, um, and so that's a non-trivial problem. So generically you can do it in the following way. You can form what's called a gradient refractive index waveguide, um, in which the, the density of your material varies with transverse position. So if the the refractive index is big in the middle and, and small at the edge, then each wave front will curve because the phase velocity on the edges is bigger than in the middle and so that curve isn't focus. Or you can think of each segment of material, each slice, as acting like a topology lens. And so if you can build such a structure, then a beam of light will be focused by that and you can, you can match the rate of diffraction to the rate of focusing and you can get away from that. And that's done in, in certain kinds of optical fibers. Uh, grin fibers. Um, so could you do that um, for this application? Well, you can't do a solid material, but you can use plasma. Now, it turns out, very unusually, that nature's kind to us. Um, in that a laser interactive with the plasma will do this to you for you automatically. That's called self-focusing. And the idea is very simple. If this red line represents the transverse intensity profile of laser poles propagating through plasma, uh, the blue dots are electrons wiggling around in the laser fields. That motion will be strongest on the axis because the fields are bigger. It will be very weak in the wings of the laser pulse. And if you remember your second year optics, the refractive index of the plasma is given by this formula here for omega p to plasma frequency. If I binomially expand that and remember the formula for omega p, then the electron mass appears in the denominator. Now remember I said that the, the motion of the electrons can become relativistic. Um, so you need to account for that by putting in a factor of gamma, which is the relativistic factor for this oscillation. And that oscillation is biggest on the axis, smallest in the wings, and if you look at that long enough, you realise that means the refractive index is big in the axis and small in the wings. So it's automatically a greater refractive index waveguide. Um, now, the, the, the disadvantage to that approach, if you like, is it's, it's less controlled and it can't be true all parts of the laser pulse. In other words, at the front of the laser pulse, the intensity is low, this effect won't be there, at the peak of the laser pulse it will be, and at the back it won't be. So it's not really quite as simple as that, but it is true that 
this effect tends to lead to longer interaction lengths than you might expect um, in vacuum. Now that's not the approach uh, which we in, in Oxford took, we decided to do the other thing, and so we'll move to um, discuss that. This is just some numbers, this is a critical um, power for self-focusing, and it's about eight terabits, which is, um, which is where we are in this, in this field. So what we've done is, is done, done the opposite thing, and build a structure in which the electron density is low, and that means uh, the refractive energy is high in the middle. So you have to make some density profile which looks like that. So how do you do that? Um, well, one way is to do the following. You, you, you make a capillary. Um, this might be a couple of hundred microns across. It could be 30 to 50 millimeters long. Fill it with hydrogen gas and run a discharge through it. Be a pulse discharge, nothing fancy at all. And that will ionize the, the hydrogen, form a plasma, and then heat conduction to the wall ensures that the plasma is hot in the middle and cold at the edge. The pressure's equilibrated across here very rapidly. And so that means it must be hot and low density in the middle and cold and high density at the wall. That's exactly what you need to form uh, a refractive index guide, or plasma channel as it's called in this case. And this is what it looks like in practice. Um, <coughs> so that's um, 25 millimeters. Uh, so here's a 33 millimeter long channel. You might just about see there's a capillary there. These are actually laser machined in a block of sapphire. So you take a block of sapphire machine half the channel, so a U-shape, take two of them and put them together, and that forms the, um, the channel, and there's some gas feeds here, and then there's a pulse, pulse uh, discharge. On the right, a measurement of this electron density profile as you fire the uh, discharge. So you'll see the electron density come up as it goes, and then you form a nice parabolic profile, and that has a certain match spot size. If you put the laser pulse in with the right diameter, it, go, it should go straight down. So um, that was the toy with Berkeley a few years ago now, and um, going on a nice laser and a lot of um, expertise, and indeed we found that by doing this we could extend the interaction length by around, around about a factor of 10 and generate some GeV beams. So here's, here's the spectrom spectrometer output, so there's one GeV there. There's a beam for the little friends there, a 0.8 GeV in this case. Um, and that was the first time that people had made GeV scale electron beams. Um, which is significant, as I say, because that's, that's enough to make a, make a reasonable single problem. So since then, of course, there's been a race, and um, uh, just to pick some of many results, um, a few, well actually the same year, a group at the Imperial College generated GV beams without an external guiding structure. So that's using this relativistic focusing effect. Um, in Texas, they have a very large laser, as you might expect. Um, and they made 2 GV beam uh, a few years later, but uh, the Berkeley group had come back um, still using these waveguides. Uh, we were not part of this measurement, but they're still using the same technology, and they're now back up at 4 GV, so that's bigger than, bigger than Frank. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of uh, history. What I'd like to do is to move to talk a little bit more about well, what do people do with these accelerators, just in outline and then talk a little bit about um, why we haven't shut diamond down yet um, um, uh, and indeed why we haven't shut down the NHC. Um, so, what are the sorts of things you can do? Well, you can start to play the games that you would do with a standard accelerator. Um, so, you can make radiation. So, here's an experiment in which you, you have a little plasma accelerator, you take the electron beam, you pass it through an undulator, so that's this array of uh, alternately arranged north-south pairs of magnets, which causes the electron beam as it goes through to, to wiggle transversely and emit uh, radiation. It's highly directional, I should say, and in this case it's about 100 dB photons, that's soft X-ray. Um, this is another way of making radiation with these sources, it occurs naturally. Remember I said, well I showed you that the, the electron bunches can oscillate transversely as they accelerate that means they're radiating as well. And that's called beta drum radiation. And it occurs uh, pretty much in, well, unless you control it, it tends to occur naturally. And you find that the, the output X-ray energy is rather high, it's typically a few kg, um, which is difficult to make by other means. So the, you get a useful X-ray beam from this. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. And this is another kind of X-ray source you can 
make in which you drive um, electrons, I can't see which way the electrons are coming now. Um, oh, here's, the, here's the drive laser, it's going into a gas jet, you accelerate your electrons to the roughly GeV scale, and then you collide them with another laser pulse, and that gives you Thomson scattering, but it's relativistically boosted by the gamma of the beam, and you get X-rays coming out, that's called Thompson or Thompson scattering source. So you can see that one of the first applications is simply generating pulses of X-rays, one of the key things here is not only is your accelerator much smaller than it would be with a conventional source, but the, the bunches of electrons which they produce are very short, they're on a femtosecond scale, because the accelerating structure is on a femtosecond scale. Um, so these things are known to be sub-10 femtoseconds in duration, and that means the X-ray pulses are also very short, which is good for time result study. And so for a while there was a sort of era of, uh, era of the fly, or the fish, um, in which people <coughs> who were completely untrained in imaging would scurry around the lab, see what they could find to image, and they decided that their graduate students probably was unethical, but they would take a fly or something like that and put it in the beam. And um, so here's some nice results from a colleague of mine from uh, Garching, Germany. Um, so here's the accelerator, so you focus um, onto a gas jet here, actually the gas cell. Um, the electrons coming out, but also X-rays. You block the laser here because that would fry the fly. There's the fly, and you rotate it. So you take a picture, so you take the X-ray um, image of this thing. You let, in fact, you have some distance here, which allows you to do um, phase contrast imaging. Um, so you're using the the, the, um, the phase shift you, you imprint on the beam to let this develop into uh, an intensity contrast image on an X-ray detector, then you rotate the fly and you shoot again. So this is, this is actual data um, from the CCD showing, showing the images as the thing is being rotated. And then if you process that, you can get 3D um, images of so just two stills of a 3D image showing the 3D structure of, of the fly. Um, perhaps more usefully, um, more recently, people have uh, started looking at samples of bone. This is human bone. Um, and it's, it wasn't attached to anyone at the time, but um, you're looking at the structure of the bone, and this is again, it's a 3D image of, of that thing. So you can see they're just starting to, to find applications, and this sort of application is clearly going to grow um, in the future. Um, so let's, let's change gear, be provocative. Um, so it was 35 years ago that plasma accelerators were proposed, and um, one still talks a lot about potential um, rather than uh, their, their, their application and use. Um, and GEV beams, everyone's very excited about that. But that's the first time uh, 10 years ago, so that's a long time. And why, so therefore, why do people still go to synchrotrons and, and, uh, and do their experiments there? And the, the short answer is that those large scale facilities work. Um, I would not enjoy having large queue of users appearing outside the lab um, eagerly anticipating an electron beam because um, these are highly experimental devices, um, they have good days and bad days, um, the, the electron bunches they produce are prone to um, jitter on a shot to shot basis, so sometimes you get a GDB, sometimes you get 0.8, sometimes you get 1.1, sometimes you get nothing, um, and so they're not reliable, the energy spreads higher, The repetition rate is low, so the repetition rate is set by the laser. It's quite often um, the case that the laser will operate um, one shot every 10 or 20 seconds or every 30 seconds, whereas you know, a, a real accelerator will operate at kilohertz and megahertz. So there, there's a long way to go, and as we'll see, the wall plug efficiency is very low. This becomes important um, in some applications. So the, the lasers we use now are less than 0.1% efficient, um, and that's particularly a problem if you really want to. big enough to provide the energy to drive the laser, and then you couldn't get the heat out without the whole thing melting. Um, so this is really an issue, and I'll, I'll just try and illustrate that uh, by considering the following. Um, suppose we wanted to build a true electron laser. Um, well, we have, a, we have a model for one. This is, this is the European X-ray true electron laser. Um, it's quite a big machine, 3.4 kilometers long. Um, 
goes between two, two towns in, in uh, northern Germany, near, near Hamburg. Um, and it's a real machine, it's really being built and it's going to be switched on next year, I think. Um, and without going into detail, the free electron laser looks like the sort of wiggle um, system I've mentioned a couple of times, but what, what's important here is the extra beams are coherent. And the, the trick there is to have a very long wiggle and to have a very high quality electron beam, and then you can get beams which are not just directional but actually coherent as well. And they're much, much brighter than the kind of thing you generate at a synchrotron, and they're about 10 or magnitude brighter. So they're an amazing machine and they're driving a lot of science, but there aren't very many of them. I think there's about two which work at the moment, and this will be this will be one of the best um, when it switches on in a year or so. But you can see it's a big endeavor, uh, it's a sort of billion euro kind of machine, if not more. So we can, we, should, we can do that, right? We can make one of those out of a plasma accelerator. Um, and let's look at the list of parameters you'd need to, to make. So um, uh, the European XL needs 17 GeV electron beams. Well, we're not a long way off, we're at four, so I'd say that's okay. Um, but they need uh, an energy spread of 0.05%, and at the moment we're about 1% at best, so that's a big problem. Uh, the bunch charge is not so bad. Um, the pulse duration is better in a plasma accelerator. It's, it's, it's much shorter than they have at, at the x so that's good. Um, the rep rate is bad. Uh, an x runs a kilohertz. These things run at 10 hertz. Um, and there's a thing called the emittance, which is basically the phase space occupied by electron bunch. That's good in a plasma accelerator. And then all this stuff is bad. So the, uh, the shot shot jitter is terrible. The, the, the jitter in the charge, the jitter in where the beam goes. Is terrible. I don't have numbers for the, the XL, but I know they're much better than you can do with a plasma accelerator. So the point is, there are some te technical reasons why we, we are somewhere behind a conventional machine, um, and these are real challenges that need to be addressed. And just to bring home the power problem, um, if you take the energy of the electron bunch in, in the, the European XL, uh, it's got 400 kilowatts um, average power. In the electron beam. But if your laser is 0.1% efficient, you need 400 megawatts going into the laser. Okay? Um, that's, a, that's a power station. Um, and then 99.9% of that is coming out of heat. So uh, you, you need to have a more efficient way of driving the plasma accelerator. Um, so let me just finish by I've got a few minutes um, just to give you a flavour of one of the things we're doing here in Oxford with um, the John Adams Institute to look at how you might overcome some of those problems and make kilohertz type plasma accelerators um, which are efficient. And so I'll just show a couple of slides on the basic idea. So we call it multi-pulse acceleration, um, and so you can guess what that is. Um, rather than using a single laser pulse to drive the wake, we, we anticipate using a train of laser pulses. So I've shown four red laser pulses here, and the basic idea is each one drives its own little plasma wave, and if the laser pulse is displaced by the plasma wave length, then each wake will add coherently with the other ones, and so the wave will grow um, towards the back of the train. And um, the, the point is, by doing this, you, you change the problem of putting enough energy into the plasma wave. You change it from a problem of storing that energy in the laser medium storing it in the plasma wave. Okay, and that's, that turns out to be an efficient place to do it. So you just put some energy in the wave, then you put a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more, and it'll, it'll build up. Um, and so we can anticipate driving the, the wake with, rather than a joule of laser energy, with, say, 10 millijoules per laser pulse, and maybe 100 pulses. And that allows you to use quite different kinds of laser to drive uh, the system. And in particular, we're thinking of using fiber lasers, so the top uh, is a sort of Example from our colleagues in Jena um, for uh, four, four amplifiers, you can see there. And these sorts of systems produce um, a few millijoules, I think the record is about five millijoules now, um, with pulses which are a little bit too long for us, so about a couple of hundred uh, femtoseconds or so, uh, but they're very efficient, they're above 20% efficient, that's, that's a huge increase, and they naturally run at uh, 10 to so we're thinking of, we're working very closely with this, this group to develop ways of delivering trains of 10 millijoule, 100 femtosecond pulses um, 
focused into a plasma which will, which will drive a wake field and then that whole thing will operate at uh, say 10 kilohertz. And so if you do some little calculations um, of the electric field, you generate these, these are these are pig simulations. Um, as you change the number of pulses, the accelerating field goes up, there's a slight little behavior there, but essentially it goes up. Um, and you can get accelerating fields on the scale of 3 gigavolts per meter. The dephasing length is um, 26 centimeters, so that's, that's three quarters of a GeV. And we're thinking that these are the sorts of parameters which are likely to be doable in, this, in the next few years. And so we, we can envisage a GeV scale accelerator at 10 kilohertz, let's say. Now, immediately that happens, if you go back to your Betatron source, you now could drive a little incoherent X-ray source, and the important thing is now this will um, be operating at the kilohertz range, so the flux of photons, which is what matters for any application, you know, how many photons per second can you deliver to your biologist, um, will be up by factors of 10 to the 4 or so from what you can do now. And so you find that the flux is very, is very comparable or better, I should say, than um, conventional sources. So these, these Gray curves are results for the diamond synchrotron against photon energy. This, this is some measure of the average photon flux. And uh, the blue curve here is what we estimate would come out of a betatron source driven like this. And notice that once you get above 10 kV, um, the plasma accelerator is really winning by many orders of magnitude. And again, remember this would, this would fit, this really would fit on the, the front of the lecture theater. Um, and you can drive a free electron laser. So if you make the bunch quality very high, you can drive a free electron laser, and these are simulations of a free electron laser driven um, by such a machine. Um, and you see you've got many orders of magnitude increase in the mean flux. And um, so we're estimating that you could get photon fluxes uh, comparable to uh, a sort of conventional machine, but, but from a much smaller accelerator. Um, but also at much higher repetition rates than you can do conventionally, unless you go to super so the point is, um, we think it's interesting enough to try and build one. Um, so I will summarise by starting with my abstract um, and saying, which we said, uh, how can we accelerate particles with lasers? Well, I hope I've given you some idea of how you can do that. Um, could we ever use that to fit an LHC by colliding into the Clarendon? Well, the answer is um, uh, not yet. Um, because although accelerators have made really impressive progress, they're getting to the point where we need them to be more reliable, much greater control, more efficient, etc. that kind of stuff. And unless you solve those problems, no one's going to come along and use them. So um, it's going to be a while yet before uh, people come here to do uh, or to generate these um, bosons, for example. Um, and there are many interesting problems that we have to overcome. Solve them for it. And I'll just finish by thanking all the members of uh, the groups in Oxford who work in this area and in Imperial College who shared results with me and the group in Germany 